I'm Jackie. I'm Kyle, and we have... Selective Attention. We love repetition. So much, in fact, that we are recycling a favorite segment of ours that we like to call... Decades. Decades. Here are the rules. Using an online randomizer, we are given a decade that falls within the range of 1930s to 2010s, and then we narrow it down to a specific year. Then we randomize a genre from four categories, uh, select all the films from that year, and then randomize again until we're given our selection. The only caveat is that our selection has to be a film that we've never seen before. This segment was created mainly because there are so many movies that we have yet to be exposed to, and it gives us an opportunity to try something new mm -hmm. instead of re-watching the Cornetto trilogy yet again. By the power of Grayskull. Or binge watching Dark for the third or fourth time. Shiza. All right, so this go around, my decade was the 1980s. The year was 1982. The genre was sci-fi fantasy. And I know someone out there is hoping that I drew Conan the Barbarian, but nope, I got something a little bit more of the uh, gratuitous sword and sorcery variety, Sorceress. My decade was the 1940s, specifically 1947. My genre was action adventure. So I got something new this time. And um, I was given the film that I had never heard of, uh, Robin Hood of Monterey. Mm -hmm. Real quick. Should go without saying, this ish is gonna be super spoiler heavy. We're gonna do a deep dive. We're gonna get into these things. <laughs> you much more than me this time. <laughs> uh, there's so many things I wanna say. My first and only selection is Sorceress, a sword and sorcery film from 1982, written and directed by Jack Hill. Not credited, if that's any indication <laughs> of how this is gonna turn out but he did it nonetheless. As an 80s baby, I have a real soft spot for sword and sorcery. These things played on TNT and TBS all the damn time in my youth, kickstarting my love of fan- <laughs> You're just- Kickstarting your love of fantasy. Christ. Sorry, I need my coffee. I mean, so. you don't have to be here. You can, I would love to be here. I could do this by myself. You could, but- Jackie's in a whole nother world. Yeah. As an 80s baby, it's you. <laughs> I have a soft spot for sword and sorcery. When it comes to fantasy, some people start with Bilbo and Gandalf. I started with Prince Adam and Kodo and Poto. I don't know who that is. You don't know Kodo and Poto? <laughs> no, I have no idea what oh you're talking my. about. <laughs> They're the cutest like ferret duo in the history of action adventure. Is there more than one ferret duos? I can't think of any. They're the only, <laughs> they're the duo. only, therefore they are the That's... best. Those of you that are unfamiliar with sword and sorcery, uh, buckle up. So sword and sorcery is a subgenre of fantasy characterized by sword wielding heroes engaged in exciting and violent adventure where in which uh, elements of magic and the supernatural and sometimes romance are present. As a compass, the ancestors of sword and sorcery would be swashbucklers like the Three Musketeers. You didn't know that the Three Musketeers is a fiction, right? Written by Alexander Dumas. A lot of people are saying that about the Bible these days. What, that it was written by Alexander Dumas? <laughs> Don't be daft, Steve. It was written by Jesus. And their pulp magazine imitators. You dial the sex, violence, and occult knobs to 11, and you got Sword and Sorcery, which got a big ass boost in the 80s thanks to the live action film Conan the Barbarian. Arnold Schwarzenegger is pretty iconic in that role, and so when people think about Sword and Sorcery, it's usually him. Well, and even though studios kept pumping out Sword and Sorcery movies, they were not well received during the time of their release, Conan included. It didn't make a whole lot of money, but it made enough for people to go, oh shit, there's something here. It was a pretty split movie too, in terms of reception. Roger Ebert called it, what, uh, a perfect fantasy for the alienated pre-adolescent. And then Richard Schickel said, Conan is a sort of psychopathic Star Wars, stupid and stupefying. Now, both of those reviews have me sold and could all <laughs> honestly be applied to some of my favorites in the genre, like Krull, Beastmaster, Sonya. Willow. Okay, so Sorceress graced the screen fairly early during this sword and sorcery film boom in 1982, like 
right after Conan the Barbarian, thanks to Roger Corman. To me, Corman's name is synonymous with talent. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 Francis Ford Coppola, Jonathan Demme, Vincent Price, but not necessarily synonymous with quality. And you know, Jack Hill, the director of Sorceress, was the writer and director of 70s exploitation fan favorites like Coffee, Boxy Brown, ah. Switchblade Sisters. So Corman approached Hill to make a sword and sorcery film inspired by the success of Conan the Barbarian. To quote Hill, at the time, Roger had a special effects studio that was doing really good work. They had done some of the special effects work on Escape from New York and some other big pictures. And Corman owned the special effects unit himself, so he could do it all for low budget. So to me, it was an opportunity to make something that would look like a big movie, which I had never had an opportunity to do before. I thought this might get me back in the business of doing mainstream pictures. I should have known better. Ouch. <laughs> That's a pretty apt preface, honestly. Okay, enough exposition, sorry about that. Let's get into it. Sorceress, whoo, what is this film about? Some kick-ass fighting lady twin sisters have to stop an evil wizard dickhead from being an evil wizard dickhead? Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, uh, but sure, sign me up. That sounds awesome. Now, despite that lazy, albeit intriguing elevator pitch, what the film wound up being was a 90 minute display of every sword and sorcery genre trope injected with bro juice. Bro juice! Bro juice! Bro juice! What's bro juice? I have no idea. I expected as much. The goal was to make a low budget, hopefully profitable film by exploiting current SNS trends. So naturally, it was a diluted and exaggerated mess. I don't recall there being one sorceress in the entire movie. Oh, that's the movie. biggest thing. We missed the whole thing. There's no sorceress in this sorceress movie. No. I guess it really is about a sorcerer that dies, comes back, and needs, needs to, to sacrifice, sacrifice children. but no sorceress intervention or interaction. Let's go down the list. Let's check some boxes. So, a sword-wielding hero engaged in exciting and violent adventures. Well, I mean, you got a, a fellowship uh, slash ensemble made up of topless twins mm -hmm. and dumb horny dudes. Do we want to talk about it? I the don't goat guy? really want to talk about really it. He was talk. very disturbing. He's kind of nightmare fuel. Very pervy. I'm seriously, I'm not a prude, but the nakedity and the horniness in this movie is just exhausting. It's essentially 80 softcore porn with really bad acting and really bad ADR and choreography. So I guess it's 80 softcore porn. All right, let's see what else. Uh, elements of magic and the supernatural. Yeah, you got some like cleric type wizardy shit that makes little to no sense. Some other bullshit, you know, zombies, a space manticore. I know like heavy Pathfinder kids that would still watch this shit and go, what the hell is going on? Does it have an element of romance? I mean, define romance. It's not, it's not in this film. There's uh, not romance in this film. People, people, people do it sometimes consensually. There's some... <laughs> There's some really- You mean like one times. Some really shifty shit happens when one of the twins has sex with uh, uh -huh. a barbarian compatriot. Fellow adventurer, co-worker. Both the sisters are kind of like interlinked. I guess they're like soul bonded in some way, shape or form because- They have twin magic. They feel each other's everything. Yeah, uh, it, it's gross and weird, <clears throat> but mostly gross. Mostly gross. Mostly gross. Sorceress. Mostly gross. Mostly gross. <laughs> so I, I don't like to talk a lot of trash about entertainment, but everything about this movie is terrible. Yeah. I attribute that to the fact that it is an exploitation piece. It's probably because the script didn't really matter. The budget was low and the goal was seriously just to get dude asses in seats to see hot twins fight in sand. Right on the coattails of the... Conan craze. Yep. This is a movie I'd catch my dad watching at like 1 a.m. when he thought the entire family was asleep just before he'd like quickly turn it over to motocross when he heard somebody in the back of the room. Yeah, this this movies were like sloppy 80s dads. <laughs> <laughs> there are better films in this genre, a few of which we've already mentioned. So if you want some sword and sorcery, Check out those films. Hell, even go back further and do some sword and sandal stuff like Jason and the Argonauts, yes. Clash of the Titans. Um, get your Harryhausen on. Or watch the one episode that Cartoon Network had of Korgoth, the animated show. 
and then get bummed that it didn't actually get picked up for a full <laughs> season. It's one of the greatest tracks since Bunheads got canceled. Man, I miss Bunheads. Yeah, you did love Bunheads. Bunheads is rad. <laughs> Since it's my take, I'm gonna hold my coffee for a bit. This is security. Yeah, for, well, I guess I don't need it because mine was uh, infinitely better than yours. Yeah. So mine was 1947's uh, Robin Hood of Monterey. Robin Hood of Monterey is part of the Cisco Kid action adventure series that ran in the 30s and 40s. Um, there were a total of 27 Cisco Kid films. Dang. Um, the specific one that I watched, Robin Hood of Monterey, comes kind of toward the end of that series. It is directed by Christy Cab Cabane? Christy Caban? Christy Cabane. I'll figure that one out. It stars uh, Gilbert Rowland, uh, Chris Pin Martin, and Evelyn Brent. The Cisco Kid spans film, radio, uh, television, and comic books. Nice. Um, it's all based on a fictional Western character uh, created by O. Henry in 1907 in a short story that he wrote, The Caballero's Way. Caballero? Caballero. You say it for Caballero. Me? Uh, I'm bad. And it was published in a uh, anthology called The Heart of the West. Um, and in O. Henry's short, the Cisco Kid is actually a murderous villain, um, but nothing in the subsequent stories or any of the adaptations do they keep that uh, character like that? He is always portrayed as a hero or a heroic uh, character from then on, which I think is definitely a better take for that time period to put a, a Mexican character in an American film as the hero and so. to make 27 of them yeah. as the hero. Early on, um, the, the first film in the series was in old Arizona from 1928, and it starred uh, War Warner Baxter as the character of the Cisco Kid. He actually won the second ever Best Actor Oscar for his role playing the Cisco oh, dang. Kid. The next film was uh, The Return of the Cisco Kid from 1939, which kind of kicked off uh, this, the Cisco Kid turning into a series where lots of these films were uh, produced and put out every single year. Um, in this one, it was directed by uh, Irving Cummings and Raoul Walsh. And Raoul Walsh w was originally going to direct and star as the Cisco Kid, but he got into a car accident oh, no. where a jackrabbit jumped on his windshield and actually cost him his eye. So he what? lost an eye because of a jackrabbit. Oh, so shit. <laughs> he gave up as an actor. <laughs> he wasn't going to act anymore. Around this time, you start seeing the Cisco Kid have a, uh, uh, a sidekick. In this instance, two sidekicks. Uh, one was played by Cesar Romero as um, Lopez. Oh, old Joker. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Chris Penn Martin as the other sidekick, Gordito. And... Then Romero, Cesar Romero, actually took over as the Cisco Kid and played him for a while while Chris Pin Martin continued as Gordito for about six further films. Then in 1945, in The Cisco Kid Returns, uh, which also introduced Cisco Kid's most famous sidekick, Poncho. Chris Pin Martin continued to play him as that character instead of Gordito. And this is kind of where I have seen him a film, one of these films. <laughs> so, enter. Enter my interaction with any of these. In 1946, Gilbert Rowland takes over the role of the Cisco Kid, plays him in a half a dozen Cisco films in 1946 and 1947 alone. So six films in two years. Wow, prolific. Uh, the one I watched, Robin Hood of Monterey, takes place in 1947. Um, in this film, the Cisco Kid travels to Monterey, California, which was then part of Mexico, where he clears the name of a son of one of his friends from murder. And that's basically all he does in the entire hour and a half is just kind of uh, weasel his way into interesting situations and somehow cheats death at a firing squad, all just to clear the name of one of his friend's sons from murder. And it turns out it's uh, a, a woman who, who killed him. So, Spoilers. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. That's the thing with these these this film that I noticed is it's one of those films that I would love to just put on in the background. All of these, I assume, kind of follow the same mm. uh, 
format and uh, plot devices where I could just see having a Cisco kid film on in the background while I bake or craft. And I think that that would just be kind of fun and interesting. Nice. I'm really actually kind of conflicted about this film also because Gilbert Roland is who played the Cisco kid is actually a Mexican born American film and television actor, mm -hmm. which makes me a little frustrated that a film from 1947 actually has some better representation than films that are made now. Yeah. <laughs> and so that kind of makes me upset. Now, of course, this film does fall into some of the stereotypes, especially with the character of Poncho. He always speaks in broken English. Um, yeah, and it's it's a little disappointing, definitely. Um, but it's never it never veers into like hatefulness or he's still like an incredibly lovable and competent and great character. He's just, it's just, it's always there. It kind of stings a bit. Um, but then once again, I'm still seeing those same stereotypes portrayed today, not to excuse it, doesn't excuse it at all. Uh, but yeah, I'm kind of conflicted about these types of things. When I was looking, I was expecting all of the, the characters who played the Cisco kid, the actors were going to be just these like white, American actors that they just like darkened their skin or mm -hmm. something like that. But for the most part, they actually didn't. They actually did cast Mexican born actors. Yeah, but these all seem like they're very tight, quick, little action films. And like I said earlier, I think it would make an excellent background film, unlike this old sorceress film over here. Profound sadness. Sadness. I hope. The next time we do decades, decades, we get something fun to watch yeah. for you. So thanks for watching. Uh, what are some of your favorite sword and sorcery movies? Leave them in the comments below, or if you've seen any of the Cisco Kid, uh, twenty-seven films. Yeah, any of the any of the twenty-seven. I'm still impressed. That's a lot of them. Or if, like me, you have a crippling coffee addiction. Bye. <laughs> We're really bad at outros. I think I'm really good at outros. Do you? Yeah. Bye. <laughs>